It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. Uh, again, I'm Dan O'Leary. I'm uh, from Chicago, Illinois. Originally, I was born there on nine. My parents are Daniel O'Leary, uh, an attorney, and my mother, uh, Marilyn Gavigan O'Leary, a school teacher. Uh, my parents are originally from Brooklyn, New York, and after getting married, my uh, my father moved uh, uh, to Chicago to pursue a job opportunity. Uh, and I was born in downtown Chicago and spent my infancy there before moving to uh, a northern suburb called Kenilworth, Illinois. And Kenilworth was where I was uh, raised until uh, uh, 18 and heading off to college. I, uh, I attended a, a charming little elementary school called Joseph Sears School and then uh, attended high school at Loyola Academy in nearby Wilmette, Illinois. Uh, Loyola was the uh, first Jesuit school I attended and I went on to uh, attend Georgetown for undergrad and Georgetown for med school. So I was a Jesuit uh, 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 product uh, through and through. Uh, and uh, I uh, now live in this area with my wife Patricia and uh, our sons Danny, Brian and Sean. Uh, we uh, were very happy uh, living here in Southwest Florida. Um, We've been uh, kind of all over the place before uh, arriving here, but I'm glad we settled in this area. Um, after med school, I uh, did my residency training in emergency medicine at uh, Arbor UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, a big trauma center there. And then I followed that with two years of pediatric emergency training at Miami Children's Hospital. Uh, my wife and I were married uh, a few days before starting residency, so it was a a hectic time. My, my wife Patricia is actually from Mexico originally and uh, we were married in Mexico. It was a very festive uh, wedding and then shortly thereafter I was uh, racing back to LA to, uh, to start my training and it's been a, a busy time since then. Um, in addition to uh, the excitement of uh, pursuing medical studies at Georgetown, I also um, was commissioned in the Army National Guard. Um, my family has a, a long-standing history of uh, military service, proud military service. My, uh, uh, my maternal grandfather was in the Navy. He was enlisted in the Navy and uh, served in uh, World War II. Uh, first uh, uh, heading to North Africa, he was uh, equipped for desert duty, but uh, before actually arriving in North Africa, he was uh, uh, moved to uh, headquarters in London where he remained until D-Day and then he uh, he participated in, in landing the troops uh, on the landing craft on D-Day. Wow. Uh, so uh, my uh, paternal grandfather was in the uh, uh, the Army Cavalry, but uh, also during the World War II era, but never, um, <clears throat> never deployed. He remained stateside. Uh, my father um, had a, a really interesting military history. He, uh, um, in, in college, he wanted to uh, be a pilot, so he signed up for Air Force ROTC, but uh, after going out on the trainer, I guess he got uh, very airsick. And uh, um, uh, bottom line, that was yeah, his uh, aviation career. And then uh, during the Vietnam era, he uh, he was enlisted and ironically became a mechanic, uh, uh, which is uh, again ironic because at that point he was a, a law student, uh, so he had. <laughs> had a, a pretty good legal background, but uh, in any case, he enjoyed learning. And, uh, but after the, uh, um, his uh, short-lived uh, enlisted service in the Army, he, uh, he was commissioned in the uh, U.S. Naval Reserve and, uh, and served as a, a JAG officer, um, working out of uh, Great Lakes uh, Naval Base in uh, uh, north of Chicago. Uh, we also uh, we lived rather close to Glenview Naval Air Station, and that was uh, it's always a lot of fun. My my father would drive us over there on the weekends. We'd uh, go in the pool and enjoy the uh, uh, you know the club activities and so forth there. So it was uh, that was uh, it was a great way to uh, to grow up in the uh, uh, you know in the military uh, spectrum, and I think that was one of the reasons that I decided to pursue military service myself. I, we were always raised uh, as, as proud uh, Americans and always grateful for the service uh, of our uh, 
uh, predecessors in the military. So, uh, yeah, when the opportunity came up in med school to uh, to receive a direct commission in the uh, at that point, I, I was uh, commissioned to the medical service corps because as a med student, uh, I was qualified for that. So, I became an MSC officer and, and served. Uh, even during med school, doing one week in a month and two weeks during the summer, and uh, it was a great experience. It was it made uh, med school uh, even busier. Med school was a super busy time in my life, but I got to say the uh, the experience was even richer because of my military experience. I had to really organize my time, and uh, uh, but at the same time, I was learning skills that uh, my colleagues were not learning. I was. Uh, learning you know, major trauma care and uh, mass casualty care, which was something uh, my, my colleagues were not exposed to. Each of the branches had originally <clears throat> reached out to me. The uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force uh, um, had tried to offer me a scholarship for med school. That, the only catch was that um, by signing up with um, each or any of them, uh, I'd have to agree to allow them to kind of coordinate my career as to you know which specialty to pursue, when to pursue that specialty, and um, and also um, you know it, so there, it was already it was um, it was had the possibility of putting um, some constraints on my career, right. and uh, so I initially uh, declined that, but I went ahead and explored another opportunity, which was the, the Army National Guard. The Army National Guard uh, did not have uh, active duty uh, commitment after med school, but really just reserve commitment. So um, granted, the, uh, the, you know, the compensation was not quite the same. So instead of having the active duty uh, component pay the lump sum tuition and so forth for a lot of my uh, med school colleagues, the National Guard was, uh, was offering kind of uh, kind of installment reimbursement, which again helped me pay off med school um, over a period of time. Right. Did um, what what year did you go into direct commission? Mm -hmm. So I was directly commissioned um, in November of 1992, okay. and at that point, since I was in med school at DC, um, I was commissioned into the DC Army National Guard. And it was neat because they had a unit called the 115th MASH. And you probably remember the TV show about uh, MASH. And uh, um, ironically, the, uh, the MASHs are no longer in existence. They were obviously a big thing during the Korean War and, and even during the Vietnam War. But uh, they've been replaced by smaller units. Uh, the MASH eventually became the CASH, the Combat Support Hospital. But they moved to smaller hospitals, which were more mobile. But uh, I got to say, it was a great experience serving in the D.C. Guard. I, I worked with some really um, fantastic uh, fellow officers. And uh, at, at that point, I was a, a second lieutenant. Uh, so I was a, a butter bar and, and the junior most officer. But uh, I got to say, people made me feel very welcome there. They appreciated my service. And I, I tried to uh, give back what I could. And uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, it was a good time. And uh, um, so after uh, after med school, I uh, when I uh, after I transitioned from DC to LA, um, we we switched from medical service corps to medical corps, and along with that, there's an increase in rank. You go from second lieutenant all the way up to captain. Uh, so I became a captain, and then uh, um, moved from uh, into the California Army National Guard. I was with the 40th uh, Mechanized Infantry Division. What sort of military training did you have to undergo uh, to receive your demerit commission? Yeah, so um, so basically, uh, they offered for med students. They were a little more flexible than their other uh, officer acquisitions. They realized that med school had a, a very tough schedule. Um, so <clears throat> it wasn't until a couple years later that I did um, Army Medical Department Officers Basic Course at Fort Sam Houston. And uh, that was essentially a, a two-week class in which you, you learn literally the very basics of um, uh, what it means to be an officer. Uh, you learn quite a bit about the history of the Army Medical Department and, and the role of the uh, AMED officer and the big scheme of things. Uh, 
Um, I followed that with a, a, another great course called C4. C4 stood for Combat Casualty Care Course. And that was a really great course. That was um, <clears throat> in a, outside of Fort Sam Houston was a, a training camp called uh, Camp Bolas. And, and they, they kind of uh, um, kind of dropped us into the wild there where we would learn kind of the nitty gritty of uh, what it meant to be a, a, a combat uh, 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 medical officers. So they put us in, in very realistic settings. So they, um, everywhere from a roll one to roll five facility. Um, um, actually, it, it, back in the days, it used to be called Echelon. So Echelon one is the, the smallest uh, level of care, the battalion aid station. So literally right on the front lines. Uh, and then all the way up to a um, Echelon five facility, which is essentially like, you know, a modern uh, stateside hospital. But uh, <clears throat> they rotate us through these uh, different uh, uh, scenarios and we got to see, hey, what are the resources available at each setting? You know, what are the types of casualties you're going to be seeing there? What's, what are the expectations? And it, it, it varied uh, place to place, but that was great experience. Uh, and what was in the 90s, what was their focus like to expose you to the type of casualties? I'm sure after 2001, your training might be geared towards something different um so like what were they really focusing on in the 90s for you as a direct commission officer sure that's a great question matt because obviously after uh desert storm uh we, we were coming off the high of uh of having won that uh, that big conflict but in retrospect that was that type of um uh, engagement really is not going to be something. Was not something we'd ever see again. I mean, that was uh, we just had uh, you know superior numbers, superior uh, weaponry, and uh, it was you know you think about it after the uh, uh, the ground war lasted you know a matter of hours. Um, so it was um, um, yeah, it was a, a tremendous success. But at the same time, after that, <coughs> there was. Uh, uh, there was kind of an evolution in uh, military medicine where we were constantly being uh, challenged to imagine other scenarios. Because, uh, um, uh, you know, yes, we won the Gulf War, but uh, uh, the, the fact was that our uh, future enemies were not going to be uh, dumb enough to follow the same um, uh, playbook uh, by right. uh, Saddam Hussein. So, and sadly enough, we learned. Um, after September 11th, indeed, it was a it was a different type of uh, warfare. Um, we we weren't fighting uh, a defined enemy. We were we were fighting, you know, it was uh, um, it was an entirely different type of warfare. So we, <clears throat> um, although we had evolved somewhat over the 90s, it really wasn't until 9/11 where um, the Army Medical Department had to uh, kind of rev up and get into high gear about, hey, how are we going to save these casualties because we were losing a lot of guys um, in the early phases of the war from from things like uh, IEDs you know we were we were losing people to exsanguinating hemorrhages from extremity wounds we were um, I remember when you know at the invasion of Iraq in 2003 um, I was wearing a Vietnam era flak jacket um, it wasn't until a couple weeks in Iraq that we got uh, upgraded to interceptor body armor but um, so everything was kind of obsolete. Yeah. So basic um, during the '90s, I was I was really <clears throat> um, focused on my civilian medical training. I finished med school in '96. I finished residency in '99. I finished fellowship in 2001. So um, each of those was an intense uh, session of um, of training, and it it, it was uh, I got to say it was most it was civilian heavy and <clears throat> lighter on military medicine, but Uncle Sam understood that because uh, un Uncle Sam understood that um, the best um, asset I would be is if I got superior civilian medical training. 
and then Uncle Sam kind of uh, fine-tuned that with uh, specialty training at Fort Sam Houston. We did a lot of uh, uh, advanced trauma laning, uh, training in the, uh, like in the animal labs, uh, learning really advanced uh, uh, resuscitative care. And I got to say that that was some of the best training of my life. I've, I've, I absolutely credit that training with saving lots of uh, 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 military personnel overseas and civilians as well. What, uh, can you elaborate on the animal training? Yes, and uh, I'll say this in uh, in an honest and respectful way. We, um, <clears throat> uh, as time goes by, there's very few civilian settings where you see animal training anymore. Um, but uh, Fort Sam Houston has very very strict guidelines in which. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, lab animals are um, <clears throat> used uh, specifically for advanced uh, military medical training and the, that training is supervised directly by uh, military veterinarians. So, <coughs> excuse me, we learn things like um, advanced airway management of the, uh, so, uh, you know, how to create a surgical airway. Um, we uh, to adapt to the IED uh, deaths that we were seeing after 9-11. We, um, we realized people were uh, dying of uh, exsang exsanguinating hemorrhage from the extremities. So within the lab, they created that very scenario where the, you know, the goat or the pig, let's say, was uh, uh, suffered a, a, a similar injury. And we would uh, learn how to, to um, to stop that hemorrhage uh, um, in the animal lab, and, and sure enough, those uh, uh, those sacrificed animals absolutely saved uh, human lives uh, down the line. There was a time when when canines used to be used in the labs. I haven't seen or heard of canines being used in decades, but um, pigs and and goat, I think we, most commonly we use goats and uh, and. Like I said, I'm, I'm an animal lover myself, but uh, the um, uh, the veterinarians were super duper strict about making sure that each animal is properly um, <clears throat> sedated and uh, um, and and the, the use was appropriate use. There was no uh, no no cowboy antics in there at all. It was as really humane as it can be. Exactly, exactly. And I got to say, even these high fidelity mannequins that they have out nowadays are nothing compared to a live animal lab. There's just simply no comparison. You know, they have hundred thousand dollar mannequins. They don't come anywhere near the uh, the value you derive from a, an animal lab. Throughout your training, um, are there any instructors? Uh, whether fellow officers, even civilian doctors or medical personnel who really stood out to you and helped you become the officer you are today? Absolutely. I think uh, back in uh, back in the beginning, there was a major Harry Marshall. Uh, Harry Marshall was... Uh, he was, while I was a medical student at Georgetown, he was a surgery resident at Georgetown. And I really admired uh, Major Marshall. Um, he was uh, a really, really high speed guy. Um, not only was he a great surgeon, but he, he was a great mentor to me because he, uh, I mean, we we're both at the same medical center. So he understood the stresses I was feeling as a, uh, <clears throat> a med student. And he tried to uh, guide me through the, uh, the process. He kind of uh, nurtured me as a young officer. Um, the commanding officer was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Green. Uh, he's also a guy I, uh, I truly admired. I didn't get to know him quite as well. He was a, a pulmonologist by training, but I, I was really impressed that he had been through Green Beret School. And uh, and I, I said, wow, that, that's amazing. <laughs> How did he do that as a pulmonologist? But he just, uh, it, was, it was his dedication. Yeah. And uh, there's a kind of a funny story I'll, I'll tell you about <clears throat> Colonel Green he, when he became the new CEO of the 115th MASH. Uh, first time we went to the field, uh, you know, on Colonel Green's uh, battle rattle, he had little notches. Um, it was uh, like uh, like he had gotten a Sharpie pen and put little um, like uh, 
uh, you know, he's like keeping score on uh, like the strap of his... Uh, like a tally. Exactly, yeah. And I joke with him, I said, uh, Colonel Green, is that all the kills you've had? And he said, no, no, you got to chuckle out of that. Uh, he was a pretty serious guy, but that was the, like the only time I saw him chuckle. But he said, no, that represents how many jumps I've made because uh, he was, you know, was an airborne uh, you know, Green Beret doc. So I thought that was pretty cool. And it, it showed that, uh, you know, the, the, there, there's a remarkable amount of dedication amongst the, uh, the, the military uh, medical officers. Um, there was also one other person in the 115th MASH, and I, 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 uh, it's a shame I don't remember his name, but he, <clears throat> he actually taught me a lesson. He, he kind of, it, it was kind of a hard lesson, but it was still a good lesson. Um, very early, it was probably my first couple drills with the MASH, he, he realized I, I, you know, I wasn't wearing the, the uniform properly. And it wasn't my, it was by mistake. You know, I think I was probably rushing from med school <clears throat> for a Friday evening drill and, it, you know, something was off. So, you know, my hat was crooked or, or who, who knows what, but he, he actually, he stopped me before I went into the armory and he kind of, he, he kind of chastised me. And at the time I thought he was just uh, picking on me, the, the new butter bar, the new second lieutenant. But uh, he, he made the comment, uh, he said, he said, sir, you need to wear the uniform right or not at all. And I, I realized it took me a little while to realize, no, he wasn't trying to uh, bust my balls. He was, he was, he really truly felt uh, he had tremendous pride in, in the proper wear of the uniform and in the army as a whole. So that was, a, I think that was a, a really important lesson. The same guy, um, <clears throat> likewise, during my first PT test. Uh, with the DC Guard, I, I, I failed the PT test because uh, even though back then I was running like a gazelle and I could do unlimited uh, sit-ups, I wasn't doing the, the push-ups to proper standard. And uh, <clears throat> so every time I went down, you know, he, you know, he, the, the, you know, I got to like seven or something and he said seven, seven, seven. And I thought that once again, he, or he just busted my balls and he said, no, no. He said, there's, we have, there, we have standards. So there's a reason we have standards. So anyway, good, good lessons. And I, like I said, he's the, the phantom NCO that I appreciate, but I, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. So as we transition to um, 2001, because that's probably where maybe you're called into action a little bit more. Um, what are your thoughts after 9-11? What, because you complete your, your residency, you complete, um, I forget what other fellowship, your training. fellowship in 2001, September 11, 2001, what's going on in your head? Yeah, I was actually at the ER working a busy shift when <clears throat> the news came in and somebody wheeled the TV right into the ER so we could watch what was going on. And I knew that um, I, I was going to be activated because, again, back then I was uh, still in a um, you know typical drill status for Army National Guard. So um, at that point, I was uh, living and working here in Florida, actually right across the bridge in Port Charlotte. Um, I was assigned to the uh, First Battalion, 124th Infantry Regiment, out of uh, 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 based in Miami. Um, here in Florida Guard, we have two big brigades. We've got um, uh, uh, 53rd Infantry Brigade, and we've got the 164th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. So, excuse me. Back then, I was the battalion surgeon for the first of the 124th, and I knew for certain we were going to be deployed. I, we were under we were under attack. We were at war, um, and uh, so we we really amped up our training at that point. We uh, you know, we were, um, I had a, a wonderful PA assigned to me as my battalion PA, um, a guy named Jerry Bartlett, another really uh, big uh, mentor to me during my career. Jerry was also a, a really high speed guy. Jerry was uh, uh, originally enlisted. Uh, he was an 18 Delta uh, Special Forces medic and then uh, <clears throat> went to PA school, Army PA school, so he became a warrant officer and then he eventually got commissioned. Um, so by the time Jerry, uh, I, I was, I joined Jerry in the infantry, 
Jerry was uh, an experienced Green Beret, PA, and he had, the funny thing, he had so many badges um, that he actually couldn't wear them all on one uniform because he actually didn't have enough room. So he had, we, we joked, he had like an Alpha uniform and a Bravo. So, because <clears throat> he had his, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, his Airborne, his Halo, his Pathfinder, um, Air Assault, um, you know, CIB, um, Army Scuba School. He had uh, every badge you can imagine, except you know, he didn't have the astronaut badge. But the point is, there were so many that uh, he had to alternate, uh, you know, which uniform he, he was wearing. But the point is that he was a, just a wealth of uh, experience and a great, great mentor. <clears throat> and he and I shared so much in our uh, you know, love of, uh, of the service and also our, uh, maintaining our really high uh, standards of, uh, uh, optimal military medical care. So we really revved up our, <clears throat> our training at that point and the, the drill weekends became really substantial. It wasn't, you know, sick call and, you know, hangover clinic. It was, it really shifted to serious stuff. We were doing, uh, major trauma um, training. Um, we were doing a lot of uh, uh, more advanced IV training, you know, because um, before we had we done refresher IV training like once a year, and a lot of medics, unless they were working in the medical field um, in the civilian side, they got rusty on their IV skills. So uh, we joked that it, it sometimes looked like, like a crime scene at the uh, the annual IV research because people were you know, jabbing uh, the guys over and over and blood everywhere. But um, the IV, thera IV therapy got really good because we were practicing constantly. <clears throat> and also I taught uh, the medics how to start IVs in the neck. I said, look, if you get extremity wounds, you, your extremities may not be readily available. So the, we were starting uh, jugular lines in the, the back of the, uh, uh, the aid station there at the armory. And I, that ultimately was really beneficial because uh, wouldn't you know that uh, the IEDs led to so many extremity wounds we had to start a, the IEDs yeah. on the jugular. So um, so it was a really um, uh, really accelerated uh, training. Um, we also tried to prepare our, our spouses for the deployment coming up. Um, it was going to be my wife's uh, first um, deployment and uh, I got to say, she handled it really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, she's a, a strong person by nature, and uh, yeah, um, luckily everything uh, went very well. But uh, um, you know, for a lot of the other uh, young soldiers, uh, a lot of them were uh, they were looking to me for guidance. And ironically, it was my you know my first deployment. So I, you know, I, I tried to reassure families that uh, I would be like a big brother or a father figure to some of the younger soldiers I look after him personally and that gave some comfort to um, some of the spouses and uh, parents of the, the younger soldiers so that was a big plus but at the same time I w it was a new experience for me too right um, fortunately my uh, my family's able the family and friends were able to look after my wife and um, <clears throat> turned out when I um, my wife became pregnant with our first son when I was deploying, so she was pregnant while I was overseas, and that was uh, that was scary, uh, uh, and it was uh, you know it was especially scary for her because she was uh, not only was I uh, you know in a combat zone, um, but uh, she here she was carrying our, our first son, so yeah, it was tough. So yeah, um, so on our way to Iraq, we. <clears throat> okay, so you don't go to Afghanistan till 2006. So, okay. yeah, so we invaded Iraq in 2003. So um, we were first staged in Jordan. We had uh, we were at a uh, we were co-located with uh, a Jordanian Air Force unit in the, the eastern desert in Jordan. <coughs> so we waited there until the invasion began, and then they uh, they jumped us. Uh, we we flew from. Um, the Jordanian air base to Saudi and then Saudi to Baghdad International. So we were arriving in Baghdad International, um, uh, ironically, I think it was April Fool's Day, uh, April Fool's of 2003. 
Um, and it was it was something that was a really memorable experience. We did the, the combat landing and I didn't know what a combat landing was until um, Jerry Bartlett said, oh, we're doing a combat landing. So combat landing is a, a highly tactical landing maneuver uh, um, in order to limit uh, exposure to uh, surface to air missiles. So, <clears throat> um, so basically they would uh, corkscrew the plane down um, yeah, so you do, you start it, you do a circle and then like dive bomber and then corkscrew again. And so it, uh, it was a, it was almost like a roller coaster ride and that, but basically it's the opposite of what you see in civilian, uh, aviation where you have, you know, a 10 mile approach. Um, yeah. Nice gradual. Hopefully exactly. No yeah. We didn't want to be sitting targets for the, the would be. Uh, air defenders uh, that so anyway we made it on the ground and then uh, we were uh, camped out at Baghdad International for about a week uh, waiting on an assignment and waiting on transportation and um, it was kind of funny I camped out uh, behind an airline ticket counter and that was my I set up my hooch back there um, and uh, that in itself was it was kind of amusing but it was at that point everything was bombed out so it was hot humid and dusty we had kind of we had to kind of forage for food and water too because we at that point we were um, an individual battalion so we weren't uh, we weren't attached to anybody yet so we kind of we drafted uh, or we kind of followed the third infantry in but we weren't really attached to the third infantry we were there as uh, uh, we were an enhanced um, battalion but we, we still needed uh, to be adopted by somebody. So <clears throat> after uh, a week at Baghdad International, they moved us up to Al-Assad Air Base. And that was also uh, quite an experience. We were kind of camped out and bombed out uh, uh, Iraqi uh, Air Force barracks and uh, uh, kind of entertaining uh, ourselves there, uh, you know, with the, the sandstorms and the younger troops were, you know, uh, harpooning rats. Uh, and uh, and there, um, once again, we were just waiting on an assignment. Finally, we were <coughs> we were um, assigned, or excuse me, attached to the Third Armored Cavalry Regiment. Third uh, Armored Cavalry was uh, in a really hot part of the the Sunni Triangle. And how many help. how many people are in your unit alone? So our <coughs> our battalion um, uh, before we left. Um, Fort Stewart, uh, uh, we were rough. Uh, um, they had, you know, they said, "Hey, you need 90% strength to deploy," and um, and uh, you know, due to illness and injury, uh, that number kept ticking down, ticking down, and and finally, the uh, battalion commander, um, uh, Colonel Moraboli, said, "Hey, you know, no." <laughs> I want you to bubble wrap your troops. I don't want to lose a single guy to a, a broken ankle or <clears throat> anything. He, he said, we, we can't, we're critically short. Uh, we, we really need to get uh, additional people. We act through National Guard Bureau. We requested an, an additional company of soldiers to augment our, our shrinking numbers. So we got uh, um, a company of uh, 11 Bravo infantrymen from the Puerto Rico National Guard. And they integrated really well into our Florida unit because we had a lot of native Spanish speakers already. So that, that was a great addition. It, it, um, it helped us uh, beef up our numbers into the, probably into the 700s, probably 750 or something like that. <clears throat> um, and then uh, after getting overseas, once again, we'd lose people to injury and illness. So, um, and it, it was hard once we got overseas to get um, augmentees. Uh, back then, everybody was uh, in short supply. As a, um... As an officer, did you have like corpsmen that were specifically assigned to you that mm -hmm. you oversaw, like whether they were enlisted or other um, officers that did things? Sure. So, yeah, in the army, uh, we call them combat medics. Uh, the designator used to be 91 Bravo, uh, was your generic uh, combat medic. Uh, 91 Charlies were uh, uh, medics that went on to get more uh, advanced training as uh, licensed practical nurses so they'd be able to work in a hospital setting as well <clears throat> and then that kind of morphed into um, 
uh, over time into, they now call them 68 whiskeys. Um, but sure, yeah, so I, in the infantry battalion, I was the battalion surgeon, uh, and we had roughly 30 people, uh, medical people, um, within the uh, medical platoon. So it was, I was in charge. I had uh, um, Jerry Bartlett, who technically, um, you know, I was the, from a medical perspective, I was the um, more experienced clinician, but from a military experience, uh, he was way above me. He was uh, yeah. operating uh, uh, on a much higher level. Um, but I got, you know, we, we functioned as peers and it worked out really, really well. So when we did end up in Iraq, we, we had such a, a large area of operations. We split up our operations. I went to the forward aid station kind of way down range. Uh, and he remained at the main aid station. But uh, like I said, I, I, uh, he was such a peer to me um, that I, I felt like each of the aid stations was providing top-notch medical care. <clears throat> we also had a slot for a medical service corps officer. Um, and then I had 27 medics uh, below me, including medics assigned to the aid stations, as well as evacuation section, which would be you know ambulance drivers and so forth. Um, ironic, <laughs> I keep using the word ironic, um, funny thing, uh, so when we, I don't know if you've heard this in the Navy or not, but in the Army we say uh, don't assume anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. so uh, that held true uh, right before deploying to Iraq because uh, <clears throat> we had a, a nice uh, uh, young uh, Medical Service Corps officer assigned to us because we had a vacancy. And that's a really essential position in a medical platoon because there's a lot of admin to do. So scheduling, <clears throat> ordering equipment, ordering supplies, doing a lot of logistics, uh, a lot of, you know, sub, um, like platoon level personnel activities. So what happened, we assumed that this uh, second lieutenant was uh, MOS qualified or uh, medical, <clears throat> excuse me, military occupational specialty qualified in his role. That is, we assume that he had been to his uh, professional school and had the qualification. And what happens when you assume things, you, you, you make mistakes. So no, he had just been commissioned and had not had that training. So the point is that we deployed for war <clears throat> without a medical service corps officer. So he, he no sooner did he get to Fort Stewart uh, for the mobilization, they yanked him and they sent him to Fort Sam to begin a multi-month uh, crash course to get qualified. So what happened is uh, on top of my battalion surgeon duties, I had to assume the duties of the medical service corps officer too, which I had done as a med student. So um, so what I, I tried to make the most of it, like in medical logistics, I would <clears throat> every day go to the hospital uh, med log uh, office and, and sit down there and order and order and order. And back then, we, with the war on the horizon, the suddenly the budget for um, uh, Class A uh, medical supplies was really generous. They said, "Look, um, <clears throat> the only stipulation is you, you if you need to purchase more than ten thousand dollars in a day, you'll need to get separate authorization." So I said, "Well, I think we can work with that." So yeah. I ordered like crazy because. Um, in peacetime, the National Guard does not necessarily get well funded. So we, um, I ordered so much stuff. We filled not only our own uh, sea container, <clears throat> but I essentially had an extra sea container worth of supplies that uh, that I I convinced each of the line infantry units. Hey guys, uh, you know you need to bring your own supplies. Uh, so each of each of the um, uh, the companies, the line companies, was given an additional pallet of medical supplies. So um, it was, um, unbeknownst to them, uh, it was helping us out a lot. But it, it ultimately ended up being a, a real benefit for everybody because yeah. um, medical logistics got really tricky overseas. It wasn't like you could you know, go to the Walmart or and pick up uh, supplies. So what we brought with us really sustained us better than a lot of the other units. What about the interaction with the Iraqi people, the civilians? Did you encounter any confrontations or 
maybe they're seeking help or like some type of asylum um, because you guys are obviously there and I'm sure it's very tense and yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. It was, yeah, we had daily interactions with the Iraqis. So we ended up in uh, our assignment uh, from the 3rd Army Cavalry Regiment was uh, our Ramadi, Iraq. And uh, again, you, you probably heard the, the phrase, the Sunni Triangle. The Sunni Triangle was perhaps the most lethal part of um, Iraq uh, post-invasion because that's where you had the highest density of the hardcore Sunnis, and including the Fedayeen Saddam. Um, so wouldn't you know, um, you know, <laughs> kind of geographical assignment, the 3rd Armored Cavalry ended up initially inheriting a lot of the Sunni Triangle. So Al-Ramadi, Al-Fallujah, Al-Assad, Al <clears throat> which ended up being just the, you know, the lethal armpit of the, the Sunni Triangle. Um, so they were really hurting in the beginning and they, they were very grateful to, to have us. But um, we, we ended up in Al-Ramadi. And from the beginning, we were having interactions with the Iraqis. The problem is you never knew, um, uh, you know, who to trust and who not to trust. So sadly, in the beginning, we, we, we uh, distrusted everybody because then that was a, a survival technique. Right. Um, and that was, I got to say, I credit uh, our battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Morabili, for, uh, for teaching us. He was a, his civilian job was a... <clears throat> official with the Miami Police Department. So he had this real good street smarts and street sense and uh, he instilled that in, in the battalion and uh, he said unfortunately you can't trust it because uh, a lot of them were playing for both teams. They, they wanted to see what they could get out of the U.S. at the same time they're selling um, intel to uh, <clears throat> the, um, the bad guys. So um, uh, and, and um, you had to, um, in the beginning, you had to shoot first and ask questions later. And, and that was, um, it's that, um, I think that that posture is what kept our battalion alive during that uh, time of the war. We had uh, probably at the end, um, the tally for our, our battalion's 18 month deployment, I think about a quarter of the, the battalion got uh, uh, Purple Hearts. I mean, it was a really high number. Remarkably, there was nobody killed in action, uh, which is just, you know, uh, it's almost impossible to imagine. But, uh, um, you know, I'll, we joked that, uh, it, you know, it was due to the excellent medical care, but it, it was obviously more than that. It was that, it was... Uh, uh, guardian angels. It was, uh, and it, it definitely had a lot to do with the <clears throat> the tactics of our um, battalion leadership, uh, Colonel Morabili, and some other really great leaders who um, have gone on to become uh, uh, huge leaders in the army today. Um, our executive officer is Ralph Rebus. Uh, Ralph Rebus is a two-star general right now. Uh, really dynamic officer. <clears throat> One of the uh, company commanders uh, um, has gone on, uh, uh, he's now General Roig, but Captain Roig at the time, really a street smart guy, uh, obvious leader. He's now a one star. Um, so we had a, it turned out a lot of talent uh, in that battalion, and I, I guarantee uh, some of the success and the, the survival of uh, the individual members of the battalion had a lot to do with those leaders. Uh, I mean, really, really sharp people. And you wonder how, how much of that was uh, native talent and how much of that uh, uh, leadership talent was uh, cultivated in that setting. I think it's, uh, it's multifactorial, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's uh, stunning to, uh, to realize, uh, you know, what was accomplished and, and thank God and there was nobody killed in action. How long is that first deployment? So the battalion as a whole <clears throat> was deployed for um, 18 months, um, but uh, I myself as a medical corps officer, um, medical corps, they, um, as you may know, at least in the Army and I think also in the Navy as well, most of the medical corps and dental corps and veterinary corps assets are reservists. So whether that's <clears throat> Army Reserve or Army National Guard, 
So they, they activate those uh, uh, assets for wars, but uh, day to day, um, the, uh, the active duty uh, medical professions are not uh, um, as robust. So um, in order to, uh, they did learn a, a lesson from uh, the Gulf War where they kept a lot of doctors on active duty too long and they lost their practices um, stateside. So um, when I was deployed in 2003, they had this new policy of the, the boots on the ground. So um, the, the boots on the ground policy uh, said, hey, look, we're going to try as, as much as we can to keep docs uh, with boots on the ground in the combat theater for no longer than 90 days. So uh, in my case, uh, they, they were pretty close to that. I, I was in Iraq for just about 90 days, but probably a little bit longer. <clears throat> Plus, I was at uh, Fort Stewart doing the MOBE for a few months. So door to door, I was gone about seven months or something, which and then I was replaced by another doc and another doc. And I think there were a total of three or four docs that um, held down uh, the battalion surgeon uh, job during the battalion's deployment. But uh, all in all, it was uh, I was away from from home for for seven months, but I was able to return in time for our first son to be born. Wow, that's good. Yeah, it has perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you come back to the United States and well, you do some more training. Um, but then you just go back to regular practice and right. then life's kind of normal or yeah, li life's pretty normal. I, um, I, I, I yeah. Was happy. yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time. I, uh, my practice was a, it was a small group of emergency docs who, uh, um, uh, who were, um, grateful for my service and covered my, uh, my shifts while I was gone. And, uh, uh, I went right back to work. There was plenty of work to be done, um, but uh, yeah, just uh, assumed the uh, the role of uh, you know back into the the husband role and the new father role. So, and then from 2003 to 2006, is it just general reservist things, or are you called back active between that time at all? Right, just general reservist duty. We did uh, end up. Uh, I did additional training at Fort Sam Houston in uh, uh, additional trauma training and uh, uh, mass casualty training and so forth. So that would result in uh, you know an extra week here and there. But it wasn't until um, uh, late 2005 that I heard that I was being deployed to Afghanistan, and that was a different setting. I, I ended up working in uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Kabul's the um, capital city there so <clears throat> we flew into Bagram Airfield which is uh, everyone's familiar with uh, much in the, uh, the withdrawal uh, flew into Bagram and then um, took a, a hop to uh, uh, Kabul International uh, Air, Airfield which also was on the news uh, a year ago um, from, from the uh, evacuations there and then I was at a, a camp called Camp Phoenix. Camp Phoenix was a um, uh, logistics base, a support base, and uh, basically sustained a lot of the forward operating bases in eastern Afghanistan. So I was uh, at the uh, Troop Medical Clinic, and uh, the Troop Medical Clinic, as opposed to the Echelon 1, you know, front lines assignment I had in Iraq, this was uh, more of a uh, this was a safer and quieter assignment. This was a, you know, I was basically uh, on a base with 2,000 people um, protecting me, so I didn't have to leave the base much at all. Uh, so I, um, uh, I was there with one other doc, um, medical doc, and we had a dentist as well. Um, and we, we had a busy uh, troop medical clinic. Our job was to uh, to take care of anybody who showed up. It was mostly U.S. military personnel, but we also had a lot of um, uh, international partners there. So, for instance, the Romanians were, uh, were there. And uh, when they were at uh, company level, let's say, they wouldn't have their own medical assets, so we would do their medical care. The Irish had a contingent there, so I was taking care of Irish um, 
and then kind of random uh, uh, countries would kind of come through. We'd take care of some Afghan civilians, including I, I took care of uh, a, uh, a child with um, some significant injuries there, and that's where I, I was very grateful for my pediatrics training. We were able to give really exceptional care there um, to that uh, child. I also got to do, I was kind of the, uh, I was the doc who was managing these very valiant um, uh, PAs at the forward operating bases. The, uh, the FOBs were <coughs> um, big enough to sustain a, um, a PA, but not necessarily a doc, but they, they, they were, a lot of them were very busy. So um, I was spending a lot of time helping coordinate care for their casualties out there trying to rush supplies to them, <clears throat> trying to evacuate um, their casualties and try to get them to the right place. Uh, and sometimes that involves sending them to uh, international partners who um, the ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, had uh, medical assets around Kabul and around the country too. So sometimes uh, we do a kind of a road show and we'd have you know, coffee or tea uh, at the other um, international partners bases to and I'd kind of, um, you know, they would say, oh, you know, we're really good at such and such specialty. And I, for, for, um, after learning my lesson about not assuming anything years before, I didn't assume anything about their, the resources they promised. I wanted to see it firsthand. Um, you know, do they really have that specialist there? Do they really have the ability to do advanced surgical care, advanced medical care? So I really wanted to see it with my own eyes before I was, yeah directing my patients there. And uh, it was it was a very good experience. It was a totally different uh, experience than Iraq, but it, it was uh, also a very valuable experience. When comparing it to the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, it's 2006, so we've been there now for about five years or so. Are the injuries that the servicemen and women are experiencing similar or is there like another increase in like IED attacks and more terrorism related like injuries uh, rather than like, you know, bullet wounds or things like that? Sure. So the, um, there, it's mostly, um, uh, once again, it's just like in Iraq in 2003, it's absolutely still asymmetric warfare. So you, and the enemies are not wearing, uh, you know, a, a uniform. They're not identifying themselves. They're 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 uh, exploiting the fact that we follow uh, the Geneva Conventions. Uh, they and and in doing so, they're intentionally hiding <coughs> fighters and weapons and ammo and mosques and schools and so forth because um, they they realize that we're we're following the conventions, but. Uh, you know, basically, we're we're fighting an enemy that's uh, that has no standards, that has no morals. So, um, the the tough thing is at the same time between '03 and '06, when we were improving our our care of these uh, these awful um, injuries, the bad guys were likewise perfecting their strategies. They were working to. Uh, for instance, with the Iranians, let's uh, let's say they were <clears throat> using the um, the penetrators. So um, they were uh, the explosively uh, explosively formed uh, penetrators. So uh, when they realized that our vehicles were getting um, um, uh, more souped up and better armored. Uh, they, they realized that they had a way to punch a hole in these armored vehicles and to detonate the explosive within that and that uh, likewise was uh, devastating. So we, um, our engineers had to uh, uh, constantly keep up the, uh, uh, with their uh, innovations and it, so it was not, uh, <clears throat> it was tough because we, at least on the military medical side, we felt like we were really learning and learning quickly, you know, we 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 focus on a couple basic things at, at the the squad level. Hey, hey, what are the what are the big killers of uh, troops that are um, that are happening from salvageable or potentially salvageable injuries? And we realize extremity trauma. So <coughs> we push tourniquets, self aid, and then buddy aid, and 
uh, combat lifesaver, and then combat medic. So we wanted we wanted people to be able to save their their, their own lives with the uh, application of tourniquet. We realized that people were dying of tension pneumothorax, so we were teaching needle decompression. So it didn't matter, you didn't have to be a combat medic to provide that life-saving care. You could be a cook or a driver or a mechanic or something, so be it. You know, uh, we had ba basic skill sets that we had, uh, uh, we had expectations of every person in uniform. Um, so we had that. We had basic airway maneuvers, and we're not talking about, uh, you know, what anesthesiologists do. We're talking about simply opening up the airway uh, or rolling somebody on their side to drain the blood out or putting a nasal uh, airway and a nasal trumpet. So, you know, they found basic stuff like that, uh, keeping them casually warm, <clears throat> and then rapid evacuation were, uh, were really key lifesavers. And we got out of the habit of, you know, waiting on uh, combat medics to, uh, to show up. Uh, combat medics were few and far between. We, we, got, uh, we stopped waiting for uh, field uh, ambulances to show up or medevac helicopters. Sometimes we had to do improvised evacuations. So, you know, sometimes they tell the cooks, hey, get those, you know, get those rations off the back. I'm loading casualties onto your five ton and, uh, you know, uh, and get me a, 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 you know, a gun truck. Um, so we, we, we realized what, what was really saving lives and we, we, we wanted to get those casualties uh, ASAP to the medical treatment facilities. And uh, so from a, a military um, perspective, there was tremendous uh, evolution and, uh, and innovation out there. And, and, uh, and we see those innovations being adapted to the civilian emergency medical uh, community. Uh, tourniquets are everywhere now, it's even in schools. So uh, a lot of good has come from that. It, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a shame that uh, uh, we lost so many people uh, to uh, uh, these devastating attacks. But uh, uh, it's nice to know that it definitely um, important lessons were learned that uh, um, uh, have benefited not only the military but the civilian uh, setting as a whole. Yeah. Well, I think the you know the United States military in general is very fortunate to have leaders like you and your colleagues or your peers who are gonna you know jump into action and implement some of these things and these trainings that are totally necessary you know, in the navy we do mass casualty drills all the time mm -hmm. a lot of people probably don't take it serious right but you know when you actually experience it you're taking away lessons learned and applying it into other settings it's no joke and yeah it's it's insane you're absolutely right funny anecdote about a mass casualty drill so <clears throat> for uh, civilian hospitals to be accredited they have to demonstrate that they do um, a certain amount of trainings and mass casualty exercises and i forget if it's every year or every other year but the important the important thing is every er either every one or two years has to do a mass casualty drill so over the years, um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, for some reason, I keep getting assigned to be on duty at the ER when these drills occur, and I'm, I, I think I, I'm the last one that needs any more practice at that training. I have extensive training, uh, and I teach um, that kind of care to both the military and uh, uh, civilian EMS agencies, but it's funny that the the hospital always wants me to be on duty to make that training go so well. But in reality, I think everybody else should be out there uh, doing that training. And because uh, I, again, I, I feel like I, I, I've got yeah. that, I could do that with my eyes closed, but. Uh, you may not be there that day. Exactly. If, in the event that it actually does occur. Right. So I think it's more beneficial, but uh, that's, that's just kind of a, a funny uh, anecdote of uh, of life in the ER. They, uh, yeah. I, I'm the I'm the the, the easy uh, uh, selection for a, an A plus on that report card. But uh, ultimately, you're right. You have to plan for uh, for when I'm not there. So we're talking about the deployment in Afghanistan in 2006. Now, at that time, is the boots on the ground policy still in effect? Are you still three months? back in the United States? Yes, yeah, I think with uh, 
At that point, the uh, the war on terror had been ongoing for a few years, so they were um, they were able to um, fix the assignments of the the medical officers uh, uh, with a lot more certitude. So they were extremely precise. Um, I was gone <clears throat> from my practice and from my family for a total of four months. Uh, so basically, two weeks of of um, uh, pre-mobilization, uh, 90 days boots on the ground, and two weeks of demobilization. So, um, as opposed to the Iraq, um, uh, my Iraq deployment, which was it was closer, probably to eight months. Um, this was precisely four months. So, um, I think that was a it was a good thing overall for uh, medical officers because it it showed that Uncle Sam was serious about um, respecting their private practices and. Uh, maintaining the, the mostly uh, reserve um, uh, military medical force um, for, for use in, in war. The, and the understanding is, look, if um, uh, World War III ever breaks out, you know, all, all bets are off. I mean, you have to be uh, prepared for um, protracted deployments, and I think that's understood. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we get it. I mean, we, again, the, the military is not for everybody, but uh, when you... Uh, when you commit to the military, you need to commit to the military. It's uh, uh, it's a it's a big deal, and we're <laughs> we we enjoyed uh, you know there, certainly there was uh, there were peaceful times in uh, U.S. history, but uh, um, right now there's there's some really significant uh, uh, evil players around the world, and, and the U.S. is uh, um, really on the front lines with uh, uh, numerous. Uh, bad players, bad actors, um, yeah. and we, we have the potential to be in, in uh, multilateral conflict uh, in the near future. Which kind of will segue us into our next deployments as we uh, as we get closer to it. But um, you come back home in 2006, you just resume practice again as normal, completing your family, mm -hmm. and... Um, pretty quiet from up until now or like uh, you can walk us through some of the highlights of that period It's still yeah. a significant amount of years mm -hmm. in between 2006 and now right um, if you can fill those gaps for us yeah um, yeah it, you're right it's been a while it's been uh, 16 years since I had deployed um, and I um, the Iraq and Afghanistan deployments did um, uh, you know, stall my, my civilian medical, or excuse me, my, uh, my career a bit. But uh, once again, thanks to patriotic colleagues, I was able to uh, get back into the groove again. Um, yeah, since I got back in 06, I did go mostly to, um, I've been focused mostly on the civilian medical practice. I've uh, um, gotten very senior in the uh, uh, the emergency medicine uh, community here in Charlotte County and uh, I've also gotten heavily involved with medical direction for the local fire departments and EMS agencies and the sheriff SWAT team so I'm, uh, I'm really I've gotten very engaged with the, the community and I, I, I get that same sort of satisfaction serving the community as I do uh, serving uh, my country with the, the army um, and also I think it's it's been a it was a good time to um, uh, raise the, the family too. I was able to um, uh, enjoy a lot of great times with uh, my wife and kids uh, as the kids grew up and uh, uh, gotten to enjoy the, the great things about Southwest Florida. So they're all, um, you know, they, they definitely are uh, aquatic kids uh, growing up in coastal Florida. They, they swim like fish and they they're champion sailors, and uh, one, uh, two of them are rowers. So uh, I think they've been, although we're not great fishermen, we, we still enjoy fishing very much. We usually go out with a guide if we actually want to catch anything. But uh, uh, the point is we, we've really, um, I, we've made the most of our, our family time, and I, I'm so happy that we, uh, we moved here to Florida and we stayed in Florida. It's been a great time. Um, I did... Um, switch eventually from uh, infantry to uh, air defense artillery. So uh, as much as I enjoyed being the, uh, the lifelong uh, battalion surgeon uh, for the infantry, once my good buddy Jerry Bartlett retired, um, 
uh, I realized it was time to, to uh, explore other opportunities and, and more importantly to see how I could better serve the Army and the, the Florida Army National Guard. So um, since 2018 I've been serving as the brigade surgeon for the 164th Air Defense Artillery whose headquarters is in Orlando. And honestly I didn't know about um, the ADA until I, uh, I began working there but it's actually um, it's it's kind of the hottest um, uh, branch in the army right now because if you think about it there was uh, over one generation in which uh, the US really didn't have any uh, adversaries with any significant air assets I mean we really controlled the skies for at least a generation and now all of a sudden um, uh, we have the uh, our uh, our adversaries are coming up with hypersonic uh, weapons, and it's making our, our prior ADA systems uh, relatively obsolete. So we, we need to really uh, speed things up. But the point is that uh, that was an element of uh, the army I'd never really been exposed to, and it's not uh, a part of the army that's really heavy into. Um, uh, medical support because uh, most of the time when ADA units are deployed, they, de they never deploy as an entire uh, brigade. So uh, most, the most, uh, most of the time they will deploy as a battalion size element, but sometimes just as a battery size element. And the point is that if you're, um, the smaller the unit deploying, the, the fewer um, organic uh, medical assets go with them. So. Um, in my current role as brigade surgeon, I'm helping the, uh, the subunits to get medically prepared to deploy. So I'm making sure they're getting vaccinated, <clears throat> they're getting their physicals done, they're getting their, you know, their teeth cleaned and their teeth fixed. And um, if somebody uh, has an injury or an illness that requires a profile, I'm helping to facilitate that so we can get these units uh, ready to uh, deploy. Because that is, I think of all the uh, the branches in the Army right now, ADA is getting deployed the most frequently. It's, it's yeah. just because uh, all of a sudden we have a lot of, uh, a lot of threats from, uh, uh, from the air. So, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's been a, a good experience for me. I've enjoyed uh, uh, the brigade surgeon role. I, I definitely feel appreciated there. Um, I am having to do a lot more of the uh, the work that typically I would delegate to medics and and PAs because we, we simply don't have a lot of them in ADA world we uh, um, we were kind of light on, on medical so you know which is fine with me I'm happy to um, to do additional coverage and additional training I mean I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that but uh, at the same time I'm learning about um, uh, learning a lot about um, air defense artillery and uh, and the emerging threats from our, our adversaries. I'm, I've uh, taken a, a course called uh, ILE. ILE is kind of a, um, a uh, officer, uh, kind of an advanced officer course uh, uh, in which we learn about uh, more about, uh, um, you know, uh, how to be a, uh, how to grow as an officer within the Army and learn more about uh, the Army as a whole and how uh, uh, the Army fits into the U.S. military as a whole and into the, the Allied powers as a whole. It really gives a, um, a great perspective on, uh, you know, how I fit into the, uh, uh, you know, how my role is important and how it, it, it's just a, it's an essential element of the, the overall uh, yeah. uh, effort. Before we talk about the more recent deployments, I just want to thank you for what you've done for Charlotte County. I mean, training the EMS and, you know, local fire department or whoever is a first responder is incredibly important. And I don't live in Charlotte County. I live in Sarasota County, mm -hmm. but I work in Charlotte County. And this town, this county definitely respects their first responders a lot. And I'm sure many of the the people who are skilled and trained probably are direct results of the things that you've done for this community. So thank you. Well, it's a, that, definitely a team effort, but I appreciate it. Now, since you spent a lot of time working with the community um, from 2006 until now, more recently, 
you, you in 2018 you switched to that uh, ADA program uh, with the army in Orlando and this year you've actually been deployed and utilized so I'd like to discuss that sure yeah so um, the um, uh, there's a um, EDI is European Defense Initiative after the uh, uh, Russian shenanigans in Crimea and Georgia and uh, and elsewhere um, the US has properly uh, recognized that Russia 2.0 is a, a real threat so um, our air defense artillery has been a part of that from the very beginning uh, we, we run um, uh, air defense uh, artillery um, elements uh, along the uh, NATO's eastern front um, and I, uh, I had the opportunity to deploy to the same theater um, recently I actually um, uh, went to Poland and I was actually uh, in a troop medical clinic in a, uh, a town called Powitz, P-O-W-I-D-Z and uh, it was a, actually a really neat assignment. I, uh, I'd never been to Poland before. I'd certainly been to Germany, but uh, uh, Poland was a, a new experience for me. And I got to say, it was a very pleasant experience. The Polish people were really nice, very, uh, very hospitable and very cooperative. Um, I, I went over with kind of uh, unrealistic expectations to learn Polish while I was there. It turned out, uh, although I have a knack for uh, the Romance languages I did not do as well with the Slavic language of Polish. I, I learned uh, survival Polish, but that was about it. But it was a, it was a great opportunity to, uh, to serve in the NATO theater. I got to work with some uh, dynamic uh, NATO colleagues. Um, I got to work with uh, some Polish uh, physicians there and, and work uh, toward uh, getting uh, optimal care for our troops there. That, there were some troops that um, needed hospital care and could not uh, wait to, for a flight to Germany. So we had to arrange uh, uh, for more immediate care from the civilian hospital. So just like I had done in Afghanistan, I did. I went on a road show and I did reconnaissance of the local hospitals. Uh, again, not once again, not assuming anything. So I wanted to see with my own eyes what the resources were. And based on that, we were able to achieve really optimal care for soldiers who needed to be hospitalized in the immediate area around the base. Um, and, and we we, uh, we worked really closely with them. And I think it, uh, uh, it left a, a very good impression, uh, the work we, we did with them. Were you assisting Ukrainian soldiers or um, is it just only Americans? Yeah, so good question. I was uh, expecting that we would be taking care of casualties from the Ukrainian uh, uh, war, but um, we did not. Um, I was <clears throat> pleasantly surprised to see the, the Polish and uh, EU um, health authorities were able to uh, manage all that. So we, I didn't see a single casualty from Ukraine. Um, it, I was basically taking care of U.S. military personnel and the occasional uh, civilian contractor. But, um, but basically, it was, uh, that was our mission. Uh, we did um, also work uh, very closely with the uh, Polish civilian uh, hospitals. We did uh, a lot of drills with them. We did, uh, I was invited to teach at the medical school there, which was a blast. And we got to uh, bring a lot of our medics over. So the medics uh, and I were interacting face-to-face uh, -face with the students at the Polish medical school. And that was quite a, a treat. It was, a, <clears throat> it was a, I think we each, each side learned a lot from that. And, uh, and those, again, once again, I, I, I am convinced that uh, we need to continue making bonds like that to um, uh, strengthen our, um, our presence in uh, Poland, but uh, also NATO as a whole. I, I really do think that the U.S. is not a, a second-hand participant in, in NATO. I really think it's the backbone of NATO and, and really um, it, it's really, I think, the very survival of, of NATO depends on a, a very strong and uh, um, uh, increasing uh, American presence there. So it was a, 
yeah. overall very, very good experience. And I'm sure the Polish and other NATO allies who are receiving the type of training that you're giving are very grateful since a lot of what's going on in the world is uncertain. And to avoid that learning on the job like you did back in Iraq and to already have those lessons learned and like, hey, like these are the things that we need to focus on, I think is probably extremely beneficial for what's going on over there. And they probably are very grateful. It was, it was, uh, I agree. It was, uh, it was a great experience. And honestly, that was, uh, <clears throat> I, I could, uh, I could definitely, I, I think that's uh, kind of a key, um, I think that's an enduring uh, uh, commitment by the U.S. to uh, to remain not only in Poland, but also the other uh, uh, less, uh, excuse me, uh, less protected or more vulnerable NATO partners, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, uh, they're, uh, <laughs> they need uh, U.S. Uh, augmentation as well. So. Uh, I could see myself being back there in the future, and uh, as I was hinting to before, it looks like uh, our uh, our first two sons are, are headed toward military careers too, and I I, I could uh, I could see either of uh, them functioning well over there. I think uh, they'd uh, be great team players as well. Yeah, that'd be you know, fantastic to have people who direct descendants from you and have gone through your parenting and your leadership ability and your training and all that stuff and they'll probably make phenomenal officers uh, once they commission when uh sorry boots on the ground policy still in effect only three months over in europe correct so it's uh <clears throat> um, due to the operational tempo or the op tempo right now they were uh, able to honor that policy again to the T. Um, <clears throat> and I was gone uh, essentially 120 days door to door. And I, like I said, it's, um, you know, uh, some people may say, hey, you know, that's not fair. The other soldiers are deployed for 12 months or 18 months. And <clears throat> I guess from some perspectives, it may not look fair, but it's, it's a, it's just a practical solution. Uh, again, if as long as the <clears throat> the balance of army medical assets remains um, located in the army reserve, principally, and lesser so in the army national guard, as opposed to active duty army, that's the way it's got to be. Um, yeah. you, you have to. Um, I mean, we need you guys here to take care of us in our everyday lives as well, just correct. as much as. I mean, that's why there's that rotation right. of doctors. So again, I, I commend Uncle Sam and, and the congressman and in, uh, in continuing to support uh, reservists and National Guardsmen. It makes a huge, huge different, um, difference in uh, <clears throat> um, recruiting and retaining high quality people. But uh, again, you, um, I think it's easier to recruit and retrain, uh, retain them knowing that uh, people like Congressman Stubbe have their backs. Um, they, they're looking out for them, so they're protecting them uh, with, with uh, you know, legislation like you, Sarah, making sure they <clears throat> their jobs are protected back home. That their you know their um, their interest rates on their loans are um, are frozen at a certain level. Um, that. Uh, um, you know, if a, a person is injured or becomes ill overseas while uh, serving their country, that uh, Congress is looking after them and you know, protecting them, making sure that they're receiving proper care at the uh, medical treatment facilities and, and also at the VA facilities. So I think it's it's a package deal. I think uh, um, it's really essential that uh, um, the Congress and the American people as a whole appreciate that. Uh, that dedication and, and the sacrifice to uh, uh, to keep the uh, uh, reserves and National Guard as a, an essential uh, component of the U.S. military. I agree. As we um, transition more into reflections and some of like uh, your own personal thoughts about military service, is there anything we left out that should be covered from your time in service? 
Um, yeah, one, well, one thing I wanted to mention, <clears throat> although I, I mentioned my wife Patricia before, I do want to say that uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I really could not have, um, I, I wanted to make sure she gets the credit uh, that she's due because uh, honestly, it's, it's not only a sacrifice by the uh, service member, it's really, a, there's a likewise sacrifice by the spouse and the family too. It's, uh, uh, you know, I think back to leaving her um, uh, pregnant with our, our son and, you know, she wasn't sure if I was going to come home uh, alive or, uh, or not or, you know, uh, uh, badly injured. So it was, uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of stress uh, on her and, you know, th thank goodness she's a, a strong person by nature, but she's also She's also extremely patriotic well, even as well, excuse me. She doesn't uh, wear a uniform, but uh, really I couldn't have uh, uh, served my country if it hadn't been uh, for a strong wife like, like Patricia. Um, she's, and I, I told you before, she's, uh, she was born in Mexico <clears throat> and she moved up to the U.S. Uh, right after we got married in 1996. And so here she is as a, a relatively new American um, and I, gosh, I, you know, when I deployed, I'm not even sure if she was an American yet or if she just had her green card, but it, you know, I, I take a step back and <clears throat> think here she is so dedicated and so patriotic and she literally just arrived in the U S and I think, um, she realizes what a great country this is and how, it, uh, she, she definitely doesn't, uh, take her citizenship for granted. She's willing to maximally support me and uh, other people in uniform because she, she realizes what a, a special place this is and how important citizenship is. So, and I, I wanted to take a, a moment to uh, acknowledge military spouses, but particularly my own wife, Patty. Thank you, Patricia. It's being a spouse in the military is very difficult, I'm sure. Many people are aware of that, and it definitely takes strong will and a strong, uh, committed relationship and a faithful relationship to work everything out. And I'm sure your kids, your children are just as, you know, uh, thankful that your wife is uh, the woman that she is. They are indeed. Um, do you think that the way that you interact the way you interact with them may be a little bit different or your perspective of people is different now that you have reservist time and active duty time and an active uh, person in the military. Yes, and I, I think um, I found that it depends on which part of the country I find myself in. So, <clears throat> excuse me, whether I'm here in uh, Charlotte County or up in Tampa Bay area, especially around McDill, or in Orlando, um, anywhere where there's a strong military presence and and also a strong uh, veteran community, I definitely feel um, there, there's overall much greater gratitude by the um, from the community in general. Even from people who haven't served before, there's uh, there seems to be greater respect. And honestly, I I know that. Uh, that's not the same everywhere in the country. One of the reasons we do live here in Florida and we love Florida so much is that Florida is a very pro-military state, very pro-veteran, and we have a lot of uh, like-minded people here. And uh, so I, I got to say it's, it's a lot easier to serve knowing that uh, you're appreciated not only by my coworkers and uh, my, my family members, um, but also the, you know, the, my neighbors, um, people that uh, I, I run into every day. Um, there, was, uh, uh, there was always tremendous support when I was uh, uh, deployed overseas. People would, uh, you know, uh, write me letters, send me care packages, and more importantly, look after my family uh, when I was away. Yeah, neat anecdote, uh, since you asked. Uh, um, when I was away most recently, um, the because uh, I, I serve as a, I volunteer as the uh, uh, one of the two SWAT docs here in Charlotte County, and uh, gosh, are they uh, they're a grateful bunch. They're a good good gr group of guys. So 
they uh, volunteered to uh, do patrols at my house while I was away. Um, so the, including the, the canine officers. So the canine, <laughs> my wife said, oh, you know, there's a, there's a police car here and there's a, a you know, a SWAT dog uh, running around. And I said, oh, that's okay. You know, they're, they're my friends. And sure enough, so these guys took it on their, their themselves to control my house and make sure my house was okay. And more importantly, my family was okay. And I'll tell you, that's, uh, and yes, there are some members of the uh, law enforcement community who were prior service, uh, but I think that's, I'll tell you, that sense of gratitude is really uh, heartwarming and uh, very reassuring. And it, it makes it uh, uh, ev even easier, I think, to, to serve our country in uniform. Um, I mentioned our oldest son is off in college now, starting today, and uh, he, he's in a part of the country where uh, there are some grateful Americans, but not everybody is as grateful or appreciative of the military. And we, we had a long talk about that fact, and not to take it personally, but uh, <clears throat> even though um, not everybody realizes that uh, freedom isn't free, that nonetheless we're, we're still our responsibility is to st still serve all Americans and to uh, provide liberty to all Americans, whether they appreciate it or not. And that's it's kind of a tough sell. Fortunately, our kids are, uh, thanks to their upbringing, they're mature enough to understand that. But uh, to some people, uh, they may not uh, understand it. You know, the, uh, so I said, look, you know, don't be upset if you see people burning flags. Uh, you know, or protesting or rioting, believe it or not, uh, well, rioting is not protected by the community, but peaceful protesting is, and uh, and believe it or not, those are the, the rights we're, uh, uh, we're defending for everybody, whether they appreciate it or not. Yeah. During your time um, in your service, whether it's Back um, in your early days of training in 1992, up until now, in modern day, uh, current timeline, is there any life lessons that you learned throughout your service that you totally just abide by now, forever, and you just that's you know such a great takeaway from your your time in service that you apply it to your everyday life? Absolutely, um, uh, we talked about this uh, already. Don't assume anything. Um, be prepared. And again, that's uh, something out of the, I think, out of the Boy Scout manual, but uh, <clears throat> preparedness is key. Um, the, I, I got to say, uh, deploying uh, to Iraq um, in preparation for the invasion, we were fully prepared, um, technically speaking, um, and uh, with the equipment and, and uh, medical material that we, we um, deployed with. So we, one good thing about being stuck at Fort Stewart for a couple months before we deployed is that uh, we had a lot of time on our hands. So we went through the, uh, the required uh, army training, you know, combat training plus uh, military medical training. We went through it twice and then we still had time before the invasion. So I was able to send my medics to to the hospital and it basically they were volunteering in the clinics there and helping out and learning additional skills and then we were also doing uh, great training at um, at sick call too so at that point our medical supplies were arriving you know a pallet a day so it's just tons of supplies coming in and a lot of supplies uh, or we had a lot of suture kits too so I taught them how to sew um, how to do you know suturing and we were doing so people were coming in a sick call and we say oh gosh how long have you had that mole oh you know would you like to get rid of it and they'd say sure yeah yeah so sure enough we we taught the medics how to do basic um, wound care yeah, excisions uh, and uh, and sewing so when they the time came they were uh, very skilled at it when we went down range also basic things like ingrown toenails. Uh, all the, the medics learned how to do ingrown toenails. They were really good at IVs. Uh, yeah, there was a point at which I think everybody that came to sick call, no matter what the symptom was, was getting an IV. But you know, skills like that, they do make a, a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And at the same time, getting them well equipped. We, we were, um, uh, 
when I first came to Fort Stewart and went to Medlog, I realized our medics had these really old uh, uh, olive drab Vietnam era aid bags, which were left a lot, a lot to be desired. So um, from my civilian uh, experience, I realized that there was this, uh, this great new um, company called Blackhawk Medical. And I think they had, that was founded by veterans, if I'm not mistaken. So I realized Blackhawk Medical made some really cool uh, um, high-speed uh, backpacks. Uh, and I, uh, so I convinced the medical logistics uh, uh, captain that, oh, you know, we really need Blackhawk Medical bags for our people. So she said, sir, just fill out the form and boom. Before you know it, we had, uh, uh, every one of our medics had, uh, and myself, we had Blackhawk Medical bags. And sure enough, uh, and I said, guys, look, this is not a gift, uh, you know, that you're not, uh, um, we, we and expect you to use it. So we, we challenged them. We said, we want you to load it with high speed medical gear and you're going to bring it with you everywhere on base. And when I say everywhere, I mean to chow, to the shower hall, to PT. And they got in the habit of bringing that aid bag that became an appendage for them. And that type of training, it was like, you know, you never leave any, you never leave home without your weapon. So they, and the, the aid bags likewise became an appendage to them. So they were constantly made uh, uh, to carry it, to carry it stocked, uh, make sure nothing was expired. And yeah. that, stuff like that actually really saved lives overseas. So it was, uh, um, it ended up being a, a, a good thing. So be prepared. What else? Um, the I think the people skill about um, trying to be uh, trying to win hearts and minds is really important. However, with the context uh, uh, within the context of uh, what Colonel Morabli taught us is uh, <laughs> you you can't. Uh, assume trust um, in everybody you have to people have to demonstrate that trust and uh, um, so but winning hearts and minds became a really uh, key lesson um, that I learned in Iraq and utilized in Afghanistan and in, in, in Poland as well it makes a huge difference um, sometimes it can be a, a, a big investment a lot of time and effort to win those hearts and minds um, so you have to you have to cherish it. Once you've achieved it, you can, don't blow it. I mean, you know, one stupid mistake it can blow all that goodwill. So yeah, um, how has the military impacted your feelings about war and like the military in general? Yeah, so good question. I think uh, uh, I think I got a better understanding of it recently when I completed this. Uh, uh, officer or professional officer training called the ILE program. Um, and within it, we learned about, uh, there's a, um, a uh, acronym DIME, D-I-M-E, and it, what it stands for is uh, Diplomatic, Informational, Military, and Economic. And basically those are the different methods by which uh, governments influence um, other uh, uh, institutions to achieve uh, their uh, their goals, basically to achieve um, uh, outcomes that help uh, U.S. interests uh, home home and abroad. And um, I realized that uh, uh, the military is not the first um, uh, line of uh, uh, of effort uh, that the government uses. It, it, in fact, in a lot of cases, it uh, should be the last effort we really did. We do need to try to, to use diplomatic means, and if that fails, uh, use informational means and uh, economics. And economics could be sponsoring um, a, uh, a smaller country with, uh, with cash or training or uh, helicopters or tanks or what have you. Um, or uh, on the, the other hand, it could be, um, you know, sanctioning them uh, financially. And, uh, and the military should not be uh, the first uh, line of, uh, uh, of effort. Um, there are some times when you, you have no option. Like, for instance, 9-11, when we were 
attacked. Um, you know, we were uh, uh, hit very hard in, in New York City and uh, in the Pentagon. And, uh, you know, in that case, unfortunately, um, there wasn't much room for diplomacy. We still used um, uh, those other efforts to um, to assemble a coalition, but uh, in, in that case, um, uh, military came to the forefront. So I, I think I have a better, a much better understanding of how the military fits into um, uh, the U.S. government and uh, U.S. governmental relations on, on the world stage. And uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I completed that course while I was uh, overseas in Poland. I was doing uh, the last uh, segment online at. And I was able to see how uh, those lessons are being utilized uh, um, in real time in uh, places like Poland. And uh, I, I think it made me a much more effective uh, officer and, uh, and doctor, ha having that uh, greater understanding of things. Right. What do you, what do you wish the general Americans, um, civilians, non-military personnel, what do you wish our fellow Americans knew about people who are either veterans or active duty military right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Matt. So a couple things come to mind. First of all, um, it's distressing to see how uh, volatile the, the country has been politically over the last couple of years. And I wish the average American, particularly the ones who are not, who have not served before um, and, and don't have a great understanding of the, of the military's role, I wish they understood how good they have it here and how, um, <laughs> how, um, how they, they should be, um, if they're not already grateful to the military, they should be extremely grateful. They should not only to the military, but for the rights that they enjoy. Uh, you know, it's a shame uh, uh, deploying overseas and uh, uh, fighting bad players uh, around the world over the years. You really see, uh, I mean, I already knew what a great country we live in, but uh, the contrast is shocking. And some of the very people who are ignorant about uh, the sacrifices of our military members are, are uh, ironically are some of the ones who are most benefiting from the liberties that they they fail to appreciate. They're 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 uh, uh, I don't know if I, uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they, now this this is a uh, it, this is kind of a slang, but uh, you know some uh, there's there's a lot of people who mooch off um, uh, our liberties with really without really contributing much to uh, those liberties, and um, I, I'd ask that they be more uh, more understanding. Uh, more informed and more appreciative, because uh, uh, you know the uh, very few people have any idea what the sacrifices uh, uh, are made by the uh, uh, U.S. military and their their families too. I mean, the family, uh, the prolonged deployments, the uh, <clears throat> those members killed in action or wounded in action. I mean, those are uh, they have lifelong consequences for the families as well. So that, that's kind of one take home message. Yeah. Is there any messages you would like to leave for future generations who will potentially see this interview, whether they're your descendants or another person who just happened to stumble upon this video? Um, the takeaways that you want the future generation of Americans, uh, future generation of military, um, maybe they're not even born yet, like you know, those kind of things that you would want them to take away from this interview today. Yeah, I, I, I would challenge um, current and future Americans to um, participate in, uh, in uh, their, uh, their country more. Don't, you know, don't be um, just a passive uh, participant in uh, society, but to um, uh, to serve your country. And again, I'll be the first one to say um, serving in the military is not for everybody. Um, uh, you know, the draft was a, a great example of how not everybody's cut out to serve in the military. But I, at the same time, I'm convinced there's some way that every American 
uh, current and future can serve their country. And it, you know, again, and and this is uh, uh, this is I admit this is kind of um, along the same lines as JFK <coughs> challenged America. Um, but uh, serve your country in some way, and that it, it could be in the military, it could be in law enforcement, it could be as a doctor, nurse, paramedic, as a teacher, as a a sanitary worker, um, but do something. Don't just uh, uh, don't just uh, enjoy the uh, the fruits of being an American without contributing to the uh, American process. And uh, and hopefully, uh, again, uh, I may uh, may ruffle some feathers with that because some uh, some people believe they do. They're entitled to all the benefits of being an American without having to contribute anything to America. And I. I, I disagree with that. I challenge them otherwise. So I think that pretty much wraps up our, our interview process for today. Um, on behalf of the Congressman, I'd like to thank you for participating in the Veterans History Project. I, for one, think it's extremely important that we capture everyone's military experience as much as, as, much as we can um, to hear the different types of things that people have gone through or the different jobs they've conducted um, throughout their service and throughout their time. So I'd like to thank you and uh, I'll give you the final word. No, I, I thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity and, uh, <clears throat> I, and I agree with you. I think it's really important to document uh, these experiences uh, uh, because uh, it's really, uh, it, I think it really is Experiences like this is what uh, really um, enriches the country uh, in, uh, and is really kind of the very fabric of American history. So the more you can preserve that and um, for, for current and future generations of America, I think uh, so much the better. And, uh, and I thank the congressman for, uh, uh, for assigning it to this important uh, job and, and uh, for making his office available today.